and welcome to City Corner, an ongoing discussion where we talk with city council and staff about what's happening in our city. I'm Holly Logan, Communications and Marketing Manager, and back with us today is Brad Anderson, City Council Member on Richland City Council. Thanks for being here, well, Brad. Well, thanks for having me here again. Yeah, it's good to see you. Let's dive right in. All so right. You've been on council since November of 2011. Uh, I just wanted to mention, you, you said you started on the Parks and Rec Commission? Yes. Is that correct? And it's a, it, I think it's a good um, thing to mention to our citizens watching that several of our council members started out serving on a board or a commission within yep. the city and then transitioned. And that's a, a really good opportunity for them to get involved and have the ability to input their opinion into making choices for yep. the city and transition that into the council. Yes, yeah the, so. yeah, the boards and commissions is a fantastic way to get involved with mm -hmm. your city and the community as a whole. And being on those, you do get to experience how city the city government functions. Right. To so where, you know, if you make the decision to run for council, you have a lot more realistic uh, exactly. view of what you can and cannot accomplish. Right. And sometimes we see that in elections, people want to do this or that and some of them you, you know as somebody who sits on there's like well it's not really going to pan out that right. way but you know that's i think that's why you do see so many that have been on boards of commissions as they know yeah and i think that comes through in shows and makes it to where they're very well suited and equipped to to handle makes them good the, candidates yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just for everyone out there, when we do have uh, openings on our boards and commissions, we do advertise that and encourage people to uh, apply online. Oh, yes. And, yeah. The and more people apply, exactly. the better. Exactly. Get yeah. involved. Super. So uh, it seems that the city's on the right path as far as balancing the need for quality of life amenities uh, with the growth that you spoke of. Are there areas where you feel we need to take a closer look at kind of balancing that growth? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a fun question. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I, I, perhaps 51% of the people of Richland think that we are balancing things okay. Yeah. You know, so that's, uh, that's the, the challenging side of being on council is sure. that you try to chart a course and go down a certain path you're not gonna make everybody happy. Not everybody's gonna agree. Sure. So questions like that where you are we balancing things well, you know, the handling the growth and people some people are gonna say, Well, why'd you build that road there? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And our role on council is very long term visions and looking looking out a long ways out. Sometimes decisions that are made and small projects that are done, little tweaks to a design, there's a lot bigger meaning and hope I, it, there's I don't like to say there's guessing involved but right you it's an extremely educated guess because you're not there's variables you know the economy could take a turn exactly things could happen but mm -hmm. you've got to plan for the course that you're on now in looking at the trends so are we doing a good job of balancing the growth and everything I think we are mm -hmm. I think we're doing a fantastic job of it and there's going to be some people that disagree um, areas that there's a lot of areas that I want to continue to work on and I got time left in my current term. And if I were, you know, beyond that, yeah. that's anybody's guess. Sure. But uh, there's there's things that the community wants. And and as a majority of the community say they want, how do we get there? That's the hard part. And when we do start to go down that path is going, and that's how it always goes. Like current construction projects of transportation right now, at the time it's an inconvenience. Some people don't see the full vision, but when it's done, it starts to all come together. Right. And there's some long-term projects that I would really like to uh, get behind. Sure. That would be could be viewed as extremely disruptive. Right. But in the long run, right. 10, 15, 20 years from now, is where I'm looking. Right. And that's a uh, and but the balancing and that's the thing too. We've been hit with a lot of growth. It's been hard. Yes. And I think we're doing a very good job. Right. With handling that growth. I think so too. And overall. Yep. Not everybody's gonna be happy, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. Great. I think I answered that. No, I think that was a I great bounced yeah. around and wasn't a big No, that was a great answer to political it. Political so. circle. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, 
last year in Richland, you could say it was a little bit of a challenge uh, balancing perceptions uh, of Richland b being a safe city, uh, welcoming to all. In your opinion, is the city doing enough to kind of meet the citizens' uh, concerns regarding diversity within our community? I think so, yeah. yes. I 100% I think so. There's only so much you can do, mm -hmm. you know, and um, to know that we are a free society and, you know, under our constitution, there's certain things we can and cannot do to each other as a people. I'm not talking just a government. So to, to go to handle that situation that we handled last year, mm -hmm. and there were some difficulties and there's quite a few things that came up for council last year. And that was a challenging one because it's hard to have any sort of, you know, when somebody feels a certain way mm -hmm. and perception and, and even if there are, and there always are incidents where it's real, right. something bad really did happen. Mm -hmm. There's, there's always bad things that happen mm -hmm. in the world and we can't stop them all. But we'd like to, we'd like to live in a perfectly peaceful, happy place to where sure. everybody gets along, but it doesn't always work out that way. We, we try to do our best to encourage people to be good and do put certain laws in place that protect people, of course, and I think they're there. They always have been there. So, and some of the challenges were last year is that perception and what we can and cannot do as a government. We can't force somebody to do a certain thing, believe a certain thing when it comes into certain, sometimes individual rights. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that y you have a right to discriminate or do anything. Sure. It's, 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 that's not what I'm saying. It's just, um, it goes into the people's perception. So when some people say, no, it, is, it isn't a safe community, and others say, well, it is a safe community, I'm the type of person that looks at facts as best we can. So you look at the police reports and you look at the data that shows, mm -hmm. and that shows that we are a pretty safe community. Right. And, and somebody who's lived here my entire life, there's, there's bad things in the world and they always have been there. And we hope that they won't be there, but we, we do our best to protect and do our best to encourage positivity and, sure. and all the, and, you know, the togetherness of a community. And I, I preach that everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. and, but there's, there's certain things that I can't, I wouldn't want to go down forcing somebody to do this or that or anything else or believe a certain thing. I always ask, you know, like anybody, what I ask people to treat another person with respect. Right. And I've said this on camera at council mm -hmm. meetings before. Mm -hmm. Be good. Set a good example. Right. You know, little things. So, I mean, that's where I would use my position on council to sit up there in yeah. front of the camera. Just be a good person to each other. Mm -hmm. There's only so much we can do. We can't follow people and track them down. If somebody files a report with the police, 100% take it seriously, and our police force does. They do. I have a mm -hmm. lot of confidence in the people we have serving our community. Yeah. And firefighters, police officers, they are responding to calls, and they are protecting people, and they are doing everything they can. There's always going to be wolves. Right. And we've got our sheepdogs out there to keep them away. Sure. And we're doing the best we possibly can. I think with everything we went through, and I think a lot of the people that came forward last year in those meetings... I, I believe that they felt better mm -hmm. after we went through that process and all the discussions we had and all the meetings we had and the things that we said we would do and promoting uh, the image that we wanted the city to have. And we put effort into that. Yes. And on the website, social media and things we say and things we do. And I, I, I believe that they felt better and they, I, you know, 100% right. satisfied. I don't know if anybody that has situations with those with that subject matter mm -hmm. uh, perhaps they can never be 100 percent satisfied but i think we did i think we handled it the best we could i think we did a good job mm -hmm. and i think they feel i think they felt better at the end of the process sure and there was good communication good dialogue between everybody and everybody had their time to speak and we listened and we did mm -hmm. the best we could without infringing on constitutional rights. We're talking about public safety. Uh, our police chief, Chris Skinner, recently resigned to take a position in, in Eugene, Oregon. What are some of the qualifications uh, that you want to see on a prime candidate to replace Chief Skinner? 
Well, for, for me, there was a lot of things about Chief Skinner that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and when I think back to all my interactions with him mm -hmm. and, and watching what he was doing and leading that police force, I don't know. I'm not a police officer. I don't know all the ins and outs of sure. how to properly schedule and manage and how you're going to patrol the streets. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't know exactly how, what he, how he did what he did. Right. What I liked about him and what I would, would look for in another candidate, somebody who's going to apply for that job, they're going to have the background of law enforcement. Right. We're going to assume that right out of the gate. What I would be looking for and the, uh, are the things that he had that I saw and saw him do were the, they're sometimes referred to as the soft skills of styles of leadership mm -hmm. and how you could encourage people to improve and to be better and to motivate uh, you know the true leadership skills being able to communicate and I think uh, Chris Skinner was a fantastic communicator yes. mm -hmm. and he walked into a room he was well prepared and so that's those are the things that I would look for I'm going to assume that somebody has all the credentials and qualifications to hold that position but when you look at candidates, and I watched his, his deal with Eugene closely. Okay. I watched his forum. They streamed it over the internet. They did, yeah. Three candidates, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I was concerned. It was pretty intense. It was yeah. intense. And I was <laughs> concerned that, you know, please slip up. I yeah. was hoping Chris was going to slip up and, <laughs> and they wouldn't hire him. Right. But, uh, you know, watching it, I read the backgrounds and the bios of these guys, all three candidates, and they were all highly qualified. They had the qualifications. And on paper, they looked fine. And it became clear to me after I watched the forum, I knew they were going to hire him mm -hmm. because he had the things that I would hire for and I would look for is that just calm, being able to communicate. And I think it's I think it's essential in that position. Right. Because law enforcement, they're they're put into some situations that are pretty tough mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, family disputes and situations oh, sure. and just some crazy think on your feet type things right. and to be able to be the interface and be the person that people go to for answers with that branch of our government has got to be somebody that can communicate very effectively and stay calm and deliver a message and a consistent message so to have the leadership skills the qualifications and be able to communicate with people yeah. and to be able to listen and I think he had those qualities, and I really hope we can and can find somebody that has those type of qualities again. I think that's good. And just uh, in being in that position and being very approachable, um, and like you said, just being able to build those relationships, not only with the citizens, but within the other departments within the city uh, and the other public safety, yes. you know, fire and emergency services, I thought that was really positive and would be imperative for mm -hmm. the next candidate too. Great. Well, we've been talking about the Dupertel Bridge for years. You've heard those two <laughs> words quite a bit, I'm sure. And now we can finally say it's under construction. That's great. Are you satisfied that the right choices have been made um, throughout the process to get the, the yes. bridge built? Yep. Good. I've been behind that project yep. for a very long time Right. and have invested quite a bit of time in um, promoting that project. Right. Uh, I think we did, again, perfection, never going to hit it. I think we came really close. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of right things there. Mm -hmm. Our uh, department that was working on Pete Rogalski and all the people that put their time and efforts oh, into yeah. that, they took a lot of things into consideration, not just legal challenges, but public challenges and concerns. And I thought every step along the way, I don't think it could have been done any better. And I am extremely excited about that project. And there, again, there's been some people in the community that think it's a waste and it's sure. not going to be that effective. We don't, we, I'm throwing myself in with Pete. Yeah. As, uh, <laughs> he's, he's a very smart guy. Yeah. I, I, when I talk about transportation, I, I throw myself in there. We, yeah. <laughs> we run models, you see, and we look at things. So I'm a numbers person. I like right. looking at data and numbers. And every decision that's made in that department, there's piles of data oh, and numbers and traffic counts and mm -hmm. all these things and projections and running models. It's fascinating. I love it. Yes. And that bridge, that's why I got behind it. I saw what it can do and having been here my whole life and 
looking and seeing how things and people move. Oh yeah, I'm, I, and yes, we've been talking about it. I'm super excited, but it's funded, it's getting built, and this is what I've been telling everybody who keeps talking about the bridge. I'm over it. Yeah. I'm past the bridge. It's happening. I got to get on something else yeah. now. So it's happening. Yeah. And it's a good thing, and people are going to be happy. I guarantee it. Yeah. And I'm ready to move on to the next thing. Sure. And the next thing, and it's happening already, and it's we're making other enhancements right. that go right into that bridge. The bridge, to me, is one, it's a road. The way I look at it, it's a road. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get another road, mm -hmm. and it's going to be an important one. But to feed into that road, we're not done yet. Right. There's a lot more work to do, and we're getting started, and I'm super excited about those as well. Right. And some of those, we can kind of speak to ones that are happening right now. Yes. Uh, it, in fact, this weekend, uh, the the upgrades to the Queensgate Drive yes. uh, from Keene Road all the way over the overpass mm -hmm. of 182. So it's going to be a challenge, I think, for some of our citizens who certainly use that um, that road and, and access to get to South Richland and onto the freeway and to work every day. So what can we tell people about that project? Stay calm. Yeah. <laughs> Just stay calm and have faith right. that it's sometimes things have to get a little bit worse before they get better. Right. And if you look at the drawings, what I'd like to tell people is, and yes, it's going to be brutal. It already is hard. Yes. Uh, the morning commutes and even Saturday mornings, I've driven through that oh, area on the, sure. even on a Saturday morning. Yeah. At around 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and it's backed up in every single direction. Like, what is this? Where are right. these people going? We're growing as a community. Mm -hmm. We're a bigger city. That's that's just mm -hmm. all there is to it. And we can't tell people not to move here. But that's not who we are. And that's, right. We want people to be here. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. we, we have to make some changes, and we have to make some improvements. And while we go through that process, it is going to be brutal. I wouldn't want to try to sugarcoat it at all. Right. That will leave that up to Pete. But as a council person, yes, citizens, you will be upset. And <laughs> you live not you too far can, from I there. Live You're going to be. There, so I'm right. I'm, I'm going to have to drive through right. there. That's right. Yep. Put the blame to me. <laughs> All right. So driving through that commute, that's what's important to remember, though. As we drive through those commutes and driving through those areas, it's backed up and it's congested. We could either do nothing and deal with it, but we know we're not happy. Right. Or we can fix it. We can do something that will make huge improvements right. to the flow of traffic and to get people pushed through there faster. But to get there, it's, we're going to have to have a couple it's months. Gonna of, be yeah. a, it's going to be an inconvenience. Right. The Richland Y, that intersection, it already backs up. Right. There's going to be increased flows that go down there. And the only, the sugar, only sugar coating like silver lining that I would put onto this is that while the Queensgate thing is under construction, just imagine what it would be like if the Dupertail Bridge was already open when those roundabouts were getting built. Oh, yeah. Uh, traffic would flow right across and everybody would love the bridge. Yeah. But we don't have the bridge. So we're going to strike that last comment because <laughs> otherwise I'm building <laughs> false hopes. So what can people expect? They're going to ex you better expect some long, longer waits. Right. But or some detours. You got to. There's going to be detours. But some detours. at the end, it is going to flow and be very efficient. It's been a great. It's a great design. I'm not a huge fan of round, roundabouts. Right. It's not a cure-all. But in this situation, it is going to work very good. Mm -hmm. You look at run the models, and this is a this is an interesting project because WashDOT is doing one side and we're doing the other right. side and working together to accomplish a common goal of moving our people yeah. up and down onto the freeway. And it's uh it's gonna it's gonna be challenging. Yeah. But in the end, and the end's not that far away, it is this will be a distant memory. Yeah. And it will only enhance uh, the benefits that the bridge will have when it's completed, oh, yeah. too. So yeah. it's it's a good precursor yes, to it that. Is. It's yeah. part of the bridge project. It is, yeah. It is, the bridge is just one of the roads mm -hmm. that ties the network together. And we're making other improvements to that network that will feed into that bridge to maximize that bridge's potential. Right. And th it's happening right now. Yeah. So just a few months and we'll be up yes. and running again there.
so at you, we've talked about this as Richland continues to find uh, ourselves experiencing growth and becoming a larger city. That, that can bring other challenges. We can have homeless encampments. We can have increased uh, code enforcement complaints. And sometimes these are related to in, an increase in drug use. Is there an answer to maintaining the, the small city values um, in, but also wanting to continue to grow, wanting to see that growth. That is going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. That is, that is the, I see that as being probably the largest challenge that future councils will have right. as we continue to grow. As you see it in larger communities, they have, they have those challenges. They have those yes. things that they have to face along with all of the things that we've been dealing with forever. Mm -hmm. You know, land sales and zoning issues. Sure. That's always going to be there and always has been. But the city grows, and yes, things come along with it. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we address that? Mm -hmm. That's it's going to be hard. And again, it, I go back to you know the code enforcement. It's a big thing for me, but it's a struggle. I understand its purpose mm -hmm. and why we have this system that we have with code enforcement. But there is that fine line that you have to walk down. You know, per a person's rights, right. personal rights and property rights. And I, I would never want to have government infringe on somebody's constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. I, that's not me. But how do you address the problems of the, the larger cities face without doing that? And it's, it's like walking a tightrope. And it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And I think that is going to be one of the largest challenges facing the future councils. And it's going to be a that's why, you know, good take, going back to the chief of police and the importance of that position, that, that person's in charge of those things. Right. All of those things that, you know, the drug use, homelessness, code enforcement issues, that's all under that position. That hire, which is why I didn't, I was upset that Chris would leave us at this important time. <laughs> the nerve. Um, but <laughs> why, you know, to hire somebody new, those are, those are very important things to talk about now. Right. And we're starting to see a little bit of it now and if you pretend like it doesn't exist and turn your back on it and just focus on the shiny new bridge and mm -hmm. all the enhancements and the, the pretty green grass out the park along the right. river and pretend like those things aren't there, it would be tragic. We have to face them. We have to address them mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. and in a way that is fair to everybody and doesn't infringe on their rights mm -hmm. and that is the challenge mm -hmm. how to do it i wouldn't even know where to begin if i were to draw out a plan on paper and say we're going to do step one right. two three four five and at the end we're we're where we want to be yeah it's a it's a challenge it's it's hard there's going to be variables there's certain places situations it, it's it's going to be tough and together meaning the citizens and the government or city government that I see is the only way that we'll get to where we want to be. And together, we will do it. Yeah. I never want to be the answer. Mm -hmm. I don't want our local government to be the answer right. for everything. I want the people to be the answer right. and to take care of the city. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, do what, we'll do what you want to do. Yeah. And we'll head you down that road. And everybody, I, I really believe everybody wants to have that community. Yeah. And it's just a matter of instilling the sense of pride. Right into their community. They yep. gotta have a community that they really, really love. Yep. And we're working hard to build that. Yep. I think that's that's a great point. Speaking of some of our cool amenities that we have as far as our recreational facilities, there's the Happo Community Stage. Uh, we've had some amazing events there. This continues mm -hmm. to offer some great uh, events for our citizens. Is there something on your wish list that you would love to see in Richland that we don't have as far as amenities go, mm. programs that we could offer? Uh, as far as programs, no. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, people have asked that question before too. Uh -huh. The city should do this. The city should do that. The city should put this on and put that on. I think the city should be in a position to encourage right. and to support, mm -hmm. but the public themselves, and, and I've seen it happening. Yes. And so that's where I'd like to see the city and that's where the city's at. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, and yeah, John Dan Plaza is a prime example oh. of that. It's just, it is constant. It is. Build that stage mm -hmm. and look what's happened. Yes. Have all these things that keep coming through. Um, 
the first annual Cinco de Mayo festival right. was down at John Dan Plaza. Uh -huh. And I, I was down there, spent quite a bit of time down there. Oh, it was good. fantastic, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was the first one ever mm -hmm. in Richland. Mm -hmm. And I hope it continues. Sure. And that, if without that stage, I'm not sure if it would have happened. Right. So that level of the city having programs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as far as the programs, I think what we have is good, mm -hmm. but encouraging those, and you know, having facilities like that right. to bring them on. Where I would like to see, my long-term vision is just, it goes right along with John Dan Plaza, is one thing that I would like to have personally is a centralized downtown. Yes. And we are working on that. We, we call this the central business district mm -hmm. in this area down here. But what, what are the things that it's missing? And not just talking about stores and, you know, what private, the private sector can bring in. You know, the people will dictate that. Right. Of, you know, supply and demand. What they mm -hmm. want, it'll show up. What could we do as a city to encourage that? And to we've heard citizens say how neat it would be to have a downtown, right, a centralized area somewhere by the river, you know, similar to what you'd find in Boise or Spokane. Mm -hmm. We've heard that. We've heard people mention that a walkable city. All these terms that keep getting thrown out. And then I see John Dan Plaza. Mm -hmm. How could I take that and tie that into the river? Mm -hmm. and make it all a walkable area, take advantage reduce of the that traffic waterfront. flows down mm -hmm. George Washington Way to where you have, you could tie in a whole section of businesses and a whole part of the city and to make it interconnected, right walkable to the river. And it would be a downtown. How could we get there? There's, there's ideas. There's been some thoughts put out there. That is one of the things that I would love to have the city work towards. Sure. It's one of the things that I am, devoting some of my time and energy to Great. is now that the bridge is going yeah is how could we make all of those wishes and dreams mm -hmm. that a lot of citizens have had come true and without building ourselves of course because that's not what we do right but to encourage that and I see it now and I've had that idea and it's been floated around it's, it's this this isn't a new concept sure but when that stage got built at John yeah. Dan Plaza all of a sudden you see things start to really take off right and part of that is timing mm -hmm. you know the community is starting to grow yeah and interests you know change when mm -hmm. you have more people there's a lot of you know people like different things and you see it down there and I, you see the people down in the park and you see all the action and you know, people hauling kayaks from that rental store across george washington way i think Way. it's awesome it is yes. it's fantastic yeah and i see that with all that traffic mm -hmm. I'd like to find a way to reduce the traffic flow, right. to tie all those businesses in, the farmer's market, even uptown, mm -hmm. to where it's more walkable and right. connected, and we'd have the start of a downtown. Right. And a downtown with a lot of a lot of neat things to draw people in. It's already there. We're so close. I think it's already happening. Right. But that's where I'd like to see the city... Take it to the next take level. Take it to the next mm -hmm. level and do a couple more things to encourage the start and some more growth. Yeah, I think it's exciting to Great transition. things are happening. Yeah. A lot of fun to be here right now. Yeah. Some downsides, but Well, and you know, fun. I just have to say, traffic, it's, you know, it can be challenging at times, but it's not as bad as some of the larger cities that not we have throughout. Not even close. Not even close. I count my blessings, really. This last time I went to Olympia yeah. was um, an overnight stay uh -huh. to meet with some legislative people there to discuss some city things and stayed the night, but I got up at 2 a.m. to hit the road. And it wasn't because I had to be in town, it was just so I could miss the traffic because if you get stuck in it, oh yeah, and it's like, I it's, don't know how people can live there. You've got a 10 minute window, I think, from where you can get through or you're stuck Yeah, and then you're stuck, then you've got you to plan your day. Yeah. And, and that's why I, I say to my wife, I said, I don't see how these people can do it. Yeah. I don't see how you can live there. She says, well then, we better be careful on how we handle Tri-Cities so it doesn't end up like that. And I said, well, well, that is quite the challenge. <laughs> but 10 minutes on Queensgate isn't as bad as it that, is not. for sure. It is not. <laughs> well, that's about all the time we have for you today. I'd like to thank my guest, Brad Anderson, for coming back on the program. If you have any questions about your city, the best place to start is the city's website, and the link is at the bottom of your screen. Thanks again for watching this edition of City Corner. I'm Holly Logan.